As Guyana sits on the economic and political crossroads, we speak to the nation's opinion leaders and decision makers to get their views on the challenges the country faces and the path it must take to achieve national development. Welcome to Nation Watch. Now here is your host Mervyn Williams, former member of the Guyana Parliament. It's April 14th, 2024. I'd like to welcome you all to Nation Watch. <clears throat> As we go closer and closer to regional and general elections, we are going to be bringing you information to dispel the Nancy stories being told by the People's Progressive Party. Today, we're going to tell you and we're going to establish beyond reasonable doubt that Guyana's economy is in bad hands. My guest today is Mr. Roy Lucas, who is an economist and an accountant, and who last served the government of Guyana as chairman of the Guyana Power and Light, yes, Guyana Power and Light, and the Guyana Revenue Authority. Welcome, Mr. Lucas, to Nation Watch. Well, thank you very much, uh, Marvin. It's, it remains my pleasure to be here. It's always good to have you. It's a pity we couldn't do a series on, on these matters, but um, as time goes by, I'd ask you to join me um, from time to time to flesh out matters of this nature as we go along. Now, the People's Progressive Party will have Guyanese believe that they are the best managers of our economy, notwithstanding the fact that rice is collapsing, sugar has collapsed, gold production is down, the price of homes have escalated beyond imagination, and, you know, crime is on the increase. People are no longer feeling safe in their homes, their places of work, their businesses, or on the streets. In 1992, Hugh Desmond Hoyt, then president of Guyana, demitted office and left Guyana on a firm economic foundation. Ghana's growth trajectory was really, really looking good. Mr. Hoyt and his government established what was called the Economic Recovery Program. And where there were rough edges in that program that required some softening, they created the Social Impact Amelioration Program, SIMAP which brought relief to the poorest of the poor and supported the economic recovery program with limited negative impact. So when Mr. Hoyt demitted office, Guyana was looking good in terms of economic growth. Mr. Lucas, could you walk us through, well, before you do that, let me make this point. The People's Progressive Party were taken by surprise, in 90, by surprise in 1992. They never expected to get into government. So they had no plan, pretty much like Irfan Ali has no plan today. And so they sent for Mr. Asghar Ali from Jamaica to manage the economy. He worked at the Central Bank in Jamaica and he came, picked up the economic recovery program and said, this is the plan we will work with. And stretched the economic recovery program beyond its calculated life expectancy because it served Ghana's purpose well. Walk us through, if you would, Mr. Lucas, the economic performance of Dr. Jagan's government from 1992 onwards. And as that relates to the implementation or the continued implementation of the economic recovery program of Desmond Hoyt. Um, thank you very much, uh, Marvin. And I regard it as a rather interesting uh, introduction, particularly your use of the descriptor, the Nancy stories of the PPP, because I believe um, quite frequently we see representatives of the PPP and the government, you know, telling the economic history of this country using what I would describe as PPP mythology, you know, in, attempt, in an attempt to elevate um, PPP as a superior political party in Ghana. Spokespersons of the PPP have been continuously treating the people of Ghana 
to a dose of economic history that cannot even be topped by an Aesop's fable. It's that bad. So I, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, um, what we saw initially under the PPP and then made the comparison with what it inherited from the PNC, you know, um, when it admitted office in, in the 90s. And to aid you in that, we'll have a, a table on screen as you go along. Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, this notion that um, the PPP has, uh, as it were, um, you know, manage this economy well, I think we should look at that table, um, table one that, uh, that, that, yeah, that, is that was just up there, presented there. there you, you can see <clears throat> that in 2000, the economy of Guyana shrank. It, it's not a case of slow growth. It's a case of the economy shrinking, becoming smaller as a consequence of PPP management. And you can see from 2001 all the way down to 2004, that five-year period, the average growth rate, annual growth rate of the economy was less than 1%. It was barely above half of 1%. What I think would be useful is for us then to... Um, take a look at the uh, table. Well, I, I mean, yeah, that, that graph there, you know, gives you an indication of how erratic um, the performance of the economy was um, under the PPP. But I think we should take a look at table two because table two is very um, instructive. Yes, this is this is the period of um, the continued implementation of the ERP by Dr. Jagan and his team. Precisely. So what you see there is that in 1991, the Guyana economy was growing at over 6%. In 1992, it was growing over 7%. And when the PPP took office under Chen Jagan, I think he had the wisdom uh, to continue implementing that program. And you can see that the economy grew by 8%, 8.5%, all the way up to at least 1994. But it remained very positive until 1997, when I think Dr. Jagan passed away. I think yes. that might have been the area. Yes. He passed away. So on average, the economy was growing over 6% when the PNC handed the economy to the PPP. So very often you hear representatives and spokespersons of the PPP and the government telling you that they inherited a bad economy from the PNC. It's not true. And that is why I'm inclined to agree with the host here that you know what we get from the PPP is a continuous dose of um you know nazi stories uh, so the robust economic growth that took place from 91 was based on an, as as the host said an economic recovery program that was prepared and implemented by the pnc under president president desmond hoyt and there he had begun intensifying the transformation of guyana's economy and Chedi Jagan understood that. He understood the value of that program and the changes that it contained. And he continued to implement it, as I said before, until his death. Now, the interesting thing is this. The strong growth referred to above raises the question, why wasn't the PPP able to help the economy to keep growing at the fast pace of the early 1990s. And you know, what, it, what I find to be very sad is that none of our journalists, I've never heard any of our journalists 
ask the question of anybody as to what has happened. Nobody has been able to explain, you know, why it is the economy could have gone from a strong growth of over 6% on average every year to what we saw as less than 1% by 2000, by 2000 to 2004. Nobody has explained that. But yet the PPP comes out and tries to present itself as the, um, you know, the virtuosos of economic growth um, in this country. So, I, 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 oh, one second. So there was positive growth in excess of 6% on average by 97. And by 2000, there was negative growth. Yes. I mean, how is that? possible well i don't know i could only put it down to incompetence because the the interesting thing about this is the person who was leading the economy at that time that was by jack deal and prior to leading the economy he was the finance minister so he should have known what was happening in that economy he should have known and therefore only he could explain why it is that he took a healthy economy and brought it to what we are seeing in the first, um, you know, period of the, um, the the decade of the 2000s and so forth, um, you know, so that's a that that's a a, a very interesting uh, comparison. And if we were to, you know, if we were to continue looking um, and making the comparisons, we can go to um, the third, um, you know, table here where we see in 2005, again, our economy shrank. That was President Jack Dio in 2005, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's in 2005, I think that's when we had a major flood. Yeah. And I don't think that flood was an accident. You know, um, I think, it, it, again, it reflects a certain level of incom incompetence and bad management that resulted in our economy shrinking by 3%. And I want to tell you, the viewers, I want to tell your viewers, these are not figures that Raw Lucas constructed. These were taken from speeches, budget speeches, presented to the Parliament of Guyana under the PPP. So the data that I'm putting to you there rep represents their own admission of their performance of the um, economy. And so as far as I'm concerned, these um, tables and, and graphs that we, you know, are looking at, um, at least to, to my mind, you know, show that nothing impressive really took place during um, the, the leadership of the PPP with respect to our economy. What I find very interesting is that, you know, we're having these conversations and we're producing data that is extracted from the government sources. And here you have people like Rick Singh suggesting that you are telling lies. Why does Rick Singh not ask Jack Dio to provide alternative data and establish beyond doubt that the People's Progressive Party, in fact, managed the economy in a manner superior to the PNC, produced the data? You, you know, this is the thing about the People's Progressive Party that, that can get under one's skin. These are the facts. The data comes from government source, but here is a person, got to be very careful here, here's a person who assumes the right to disrespect a learned professor, a gentleman who is responsible for educating hundreds of citizens of this country, perhaps some, do, some of those who are government ministers under the PPP right now and the disrespect is there. But fish rot from the head because this is Jack Dio's behavior. You can't win an argument, so you throw dust in people's eyes. Why does Jack Dio not produce empirical evidence 
of his stewardship or the stewardship of the People's Progressive Party as it relates to Guyana's economy when touting that they are better managers of our economy? Well, I, I don't even have to go there. Look, the data, as I said, is coming from budget speeches that were laid before Parliament. So are we saying that in presenting this information the PPP to PPP Parliament... lying to the nation. They're lying to the... And not only that, they're disrespecting our Parliament. That's what Rick Singh is saying. So, I mean, I really and truly have no interest in listening to that sort of um, nonsense. I wonder what his real name is. It might be Barrett Bindial or somebody yeah, like that. I, 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 I don't want to get into personalities on the matter. I want to present information that the people of this country could properly absorb because it looks to me as if our journalists don't spend time looking at the economic history of this country, the correct economic history of this country that is often told in dates and data, and which is what I am presenting here because I am presenting evidence that has um, occurred over time. And as I said before, all of the information that I'm presenting here appears in budget speeches prepared by the People's Progressive Party and placed before the parliament of this country. So I'm not trying to engage in some yeah. kind of, you know, uh, Nancy story yes. or mythology like the people. So, so, so we move on. Let's go back to table three. Table 3 establishes that the economy really, really took a beating in 2005. Um, the, only, the only event in 2005 that could have adversely have impacted production was the flood. And you started off by speaking, by giving your, your, your opinion with respect to the flood of 2005. For many Guyanese, it came over as a distraction of tremendous magnitude. Why, why would any administration hurt its citizens um, to score points? Is it because of the levels of incompetence being so very high that um, the only logical outcome would have been a failure, and therefore you create an excuse for a failure. Well, I mean, I don't know these individuals personally. They're not friends of mine, and um, we have never had a conversation, you know, about what might have been motivations or the cause um, of the three uh, percent you know, loss of income and output in our economy. But I think what is important here is for us to recognize that these fellows are not infallible. They are prone to make mistakes, but they try to project themselves as being invincible. And I think until we and they themselves acknowledge that they live on planet Earth where there are things referred to as human frailties, we will always continue to have this problem in our country. And it appears to me as if these fellows have believed that um, <clears throat> you know, um, good governance is reflected in the art of deception and that this country, or as far as they're concerned, they cannot afford, um, you know, integrity in this country. It, it seems as if they believe it's too high a price to pay to be honest about what is happening in this country. Because what they don't recognize is the impact that their um, failure to be truthful and honest is having on the lives of people in this country. We'll go to table four, where we bring some <clears throat> more expanded numbers. And you'll see that on table four, 
which spans from 2000 to 2014, that period leading up to the People's Progressive Party demitting office, you'll see that, and of course we're talking about pre-oil um, economy here. We didn't have oil yet. Um, and even when the APNU left office, we still didn't have um, revenues coming from oil. So here you are with three years of um, negative growth. And um, this is a this is a large span with an average growth of 2.6 percent from 2000 to 2014. This includes the Jagdeo and Ramutar um, presidencies. Mm -hmm. Walk us through these numbers, if you will, please, sir, and tell us what you believe are the factors based on the numbers that you have at your disposal responsible for the shrinking of the economy um, so very often during that period? Well, again, um, what I would say is um, I could only, because there's nothing um, out there that explains why it is that the <coughs> PPP was unable to maintain the growth rates of the 90s right because the economy was set to continue growing at that kind of pace and it appears to me as if um you know it, it's a reflection of an unwillingness of um the people who were leading the country at the time to really you know motivate Guyanese to um, you know, do the things that were necessary to help this economy to continue growing in good strength. Um, you know, I I think one of the things that we we, we saw was that um, the 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 you know the there was a lack of innovation. Nobody was incentivizing the people of this country to be innovative, so that we could um, take advantage of the opportunities that were emerging at the time globally. Um, we weren't, for example, investing in expanding access for our students, for example, um, in um, you know, science and, 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 and uh, technology. Uh, we weren't, many of our schools continue to, up to today not to have adequate science labs where a lot of our kids, you know, could um, really and truly perhaps discover their talents and hone them if that is something that they want uh, to do in life and so forth. We don't, up to today, we don't have that. As you know, um, Guyana had introduced a number of um, high schools, I think they were called community high schools. Yeah. Um, to allow those persons who were perhaps not academically inclined to begin the, the process of preparing themselves for um, some kind of vocation, some kind of um, jobs that they would be able to be independent, um, in which they would be able to be, um, you know, um, self, um, feel some degree of self-respect and so forth, and that would have put them in a position today to be able to make a smooth um, transition into the oil and gas industry, perhaps going, having gone through some of the other technical institutes that we have in this country or had in this country, and so forth. So to me, um, it appears as if, you know, there was this lack of attention um, to really and truly enabling the people of this country um, to, you know, to do some of the things that they can do. And we still have the ability, the people of this country still have the ability to do lots of things that perhaps they're not being given the opportunity to do at this particular point um, in time. Mr. Lucas, it is evident from the numbers that we've been looking at of the year 2014 that the People's Progressive Party has lost its way as far as managing Guyana's economy is concerned. 
from the time the economic recovery program of Desmond Hoyt um, came to an end, whenever that was, 97 or whenever it was, inconsistencies in the numbers, in the growth numbers, emerged. The trouble is that young people in Guyana at this time only have a short period of time to look back upon to make decisions. See, going back to 1991 to 97 is not something that the average young voter is going to do. But looking back at the last four years is what a young person is likely to do. And looking back at the last four years, a young person will be confronted by huge numbers, like $1.46 trillion in a budget and so on. In terms of looking back up to 2014, for now, what would you say to a young voter in terms of the performance of our economy and what direction it was heading and how best to take a position on such an issue? Well, I think um, perhaps it might be, for me to be able to do that, I think we need to take a look at what happened we during going, the um, APNU, PNC, we going, TFC yeah. uh, um, period. We're going there um, right now. Um, you know, I, I, if, I think you have a... Yes, we have a, a table five there, mm -hmm. table four there. No, right? five. I think yeah. you have a table five We there. have a five. Um, which table five demonstrates over a very short period of time the granger led government without any additional resources of state um bringing some level of buoyancy to the economy averaging out at almost four percent annual growth granger has been criticized as president for bringing 200 taxes something we know is absolute misinformation. Um, Mr. Winston Jordan has put paid to that at least on two occasions, right here in Nation Watch and in other places. So here we are, ladies and gentlemen, with numbers up there on your screen, indicative of the, or indicating the management and stewardship of Guyana's economy under David Granger as president and Winston Jordan as minister of finance. And Mr. Lucas will continue. I'm sorry for the rude interruption. No, no, no. That that's all right. I think I think um, that table, in a way, summarizes the comparison between w the management of the economy under the PPP and the management of the economy by the coalition government of APNU and the AFC. I think what you what you see clearly is that in the five years that the APNU is given to first of all fix a lot of the problems because clearly if from 2000 to 2014 your economy could only grow at 2.66 percent and you've had uh, at least three points in time in which the economy shrank then you knew that over that period of time there were problems and a lot of people may have forgotten about the Skeldon um, fiasco where over $200 million is spent and we haven't gotten anything of consequence out of that investment. I know a lot of people have forgotten that there was a financial scandal involving insurance companies in this country where we actually lost one of our insurance companies um, Clico and billions of dollars and, and billions of dollars um, with it. So you knew that there were problems apart from all the other social ills that you alluded to uh, just now. So in actual fact, um, the PPP, unlike what the PNC did in 1992, where the PNC handed them a strong economy, a robustly growing economy, they handed to the APNU coalition in 2015, an economy that was struggling. 
an economy that had a whole heap of problems. But yet, you can see from the data on that table, again, that is data if you went today to the um, 2023 budget speech of the PPP laid in Parliament, you will find that data. This is not Raw Lucas making up this. This is Raw Lucas extracting information laid before our Parliament in the form of a budget presentation, um, pulling out those numbers to help Guyanese to appreciate and understand that um, they're they are very often treated to a dose of, um, you know, um, on truths which are not necessarily uh, consistent with their reality in life in this country or living in this country. Now, so if you were to summarize this um, comparison, you know, the, between the 2000-2014 the, the, the period, um, you will see that the economy experienced negative growth three times under the PPP, mm -hmm. and that never happened under the APNU PNC or AFC coalition from 2015 to 2019. You'll see that. The PPP has never grown the economy faster than APNU. You can see from 20, 2000 to 2014, the fastest the PPP was able to grow the economy was at 5.4%. Yeah. And you saw the APNU was actually increasing the growth rate when it demitted office. Because in 2019, um, we would see that the growth rate was 5.4%. So it was on a positive trajectory um, when, you know, of course, um, people felt that maybe the PPP's stories were better than the experiences that they were having under the uh, coalition government. Um, you know, so to me, the statistics and graphics that um, we have shown here indicate that the PNC can implement strong economic programs and manage the economy better than the PPP. To the extent that in 1992, as well as 2020, PNC-led governments have left successor governments with solid economic footing or unsolid economic footing with positive economic growth trajectory. Now, it was the AP and UAFC that facilitated the extraction, successful extraction and and, um, and revenue earnings from oil. Again, leaving the People's Progressive Party with a solid flow of revenues. There is that consistency. There's the other consistency where the People's Progressive Party have always held out that they have inherited an empty treasury. Comment, please, on, on those two points. Well, I, I don't know how they... Um, to rationalize their own stories. Uh, but I will say this, and in a way I'm glad you have raised this point. You know, since the coalition government revealed the um, production sharing agreement between the government and uh, the country and Exxon and its partners, people have focused on the um, comparison of our oil agreement, our PSA, with those of other countries. That is fair. But I think the mistake they're making is failing to compare the impact of the economic policies of the coalition you know, PNC, APNU, and the AFC, with the economic impact of the PPP. You can see from the PSA what the coalition agreed that Exxon and its partners could enjoy in terms of economic policy. Nobody can tell me up to today what 
what is the um, the details of the bauxite agreements that have been signed by the PPP government. Nobody today can tell me the impact of the manganese agreement that has been signed by the PPP government. Nobody up to today can tell me what is the impact of the forestry agreements that were signed by the PPP with these foreign groups. Nobody today can tell me what is the um, the details and the impact of the pharmaceutical agreements that the PPP government has signed with the foreign investor that runs this new GPC organization. Nobody. But you can see what the production sharing agreement has done, what it says and what it, and we can see today the impact of that. Oil growth in 2020, our economy grew in 2020 by 38%. Our economy grew in 2021 by 25% or something like that. In 2022, the economy grew by another 60 something percent. And in 2023, I think it grew by another 33%. I mean, which on paper looks excellent, except that there's no impact from that on the lives of ordinary citizens of the and country that, and that is part of our problem so what you're seeing again is the way in which resources are being managed by the ppp they're spending money lots of it but people are not feeling the impact of those resources on their lives so the point i really want to make here is this and people have to stop looking at whether there's ring fencing and that fencing and decommissioning and that sort of uh, thing in our PSA because it is not going to change. We can take the lessons for the future, but what is relevant is the impact of those policies on the lives of the people of this country. And I'm telling you right now, and I guess people are experiencing it for themselves, that they are not feeling that they're included in the resources of um, our patrimony. Two things here, Mr. Lucas. One is that citizens need to recognize that all of the development that is taking place in this country is thanks to the AP and UAFC administration and that production sharing agreement which is financing in large measure infrastructure and other developments across the country. Without oil, we would have been a mess, particularly under the People's Progressive Party. Now, that's the first point. The second thing is this. Bart Jagdio had as, at his disposal 16% value added tax, which was imposed on the citizen of this, citizens of this country. Citizens protested. We protested as parliamentarians back then in front of the parliament. The security forces locked us out of that brick dam roadway in front of the parliament because they knew we were there to protest. Although we were members of parliament, we were not allowed beyond the barriers. He had 16% VAT from which he got a windfall in tax collection that never was never used for the benefit of the citizens of this country in any significant way whatsoever. But the Granger administration of 2015 to 2020, instead of carrying on with Mr. Jagdio's 13% value added tax, 16% value added tax, I beg your pardon, slashed it to 14%, two percentage points off, and still grew the national economy consistently. What does that say for Mr. Jack Dio and Dr. Ashni Singh, his Minister of Finance? Well, what I would say to you is this. Um, it, it, I, I think it, it, it clearly shows that there isn't um, sufficient sensitivity when it comes to dealing with um, the people um, of this country. Um, you know, I, I would say that um, when we take a look at the um, 
views, and I'll say this, I think I, sh I should say this at, at this point. I had an, an opportunity to um, speak with the um, leader of the opposition. And, you know, he shared with me his views with respect to the people center development um, strat strategy. And I think when you listen to what he, he has to say, you would recognize that, um, you know, how interested is he is in the welfare of the people of this country compared to um, the way in which the PPP is treating the people of this country. You know, I, I got the impression from Mr. Norton that he intends to ensure that oil money reaches the pockets of everybody. That's his intention. I got the impression that as far as he's concerned, every Guyanese will be given the opportunity to build a life that they want for themselves and their family, including owning their homes. I got the impression from him that he will incentivize workers to stay and build the country as against those who are being very callous about the welfare and the living conditions and the quality of life of the people of this country. You see, what I recognize about Norton's people-centered development strategy is that it embraces the needs, ambitions, and aspirations of the people of this country. And to my mind, it will be a game changer. Um, I think it is inclusive and people will feel included in the national economy. Unlike the one Guyana slogan, which contrary to its name, seeks to marginalize a large section of the populace. Norton's PCDS emphasizes collaboration and bringing people together. You know, I, 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 in looking at it, the many acts of the government leaves the people feeling as if one Guyana is about normalizing corruption and nepotism. But Norton's PCDS, Norton's People Centered Development Strategy, aims to give every person in Guyana the freedom to be who they want to be and all they want to be. So I think people will be as excited as I am to hear him set out the details of his people center development strategy and will want to join and support him to achieve those goals. Which brings to mind two questions. <clears throat> the people center development strategy speaks of every citizen owning a home, a rent to pay scheme, where you buy a property, the house is constructed, it's fully um, equipped with all utilities and so on, and you pay a rent for as long as it takes to pay off the cost of the home. And when you pay it off, by the time you pay off the cost of the home, you get title to the property. It's now yours. So it's as though the old people used to call it balance parcel. It's like a higher purchase, purchase, purchase. arrangement. Um, on the other hand, the People's Progressive Party is talking about young professionals homes or homes for young professionals and the cost of which has gone up in some instances by more than 80 percent in an economy where the working class the working people and these days more properly described as the working poor <laughs> can barely afford to eat where are they going to get the money to pay for these homes the prices of which have almost doubled. Well, I can tell you from what you just described that life will remain tough on the PPP. Um, you know, the, the rent-to-own uh, model that you just described, as far as I understand it, is just one option that is available in the Norton People Center Development um, Strategy. But I think what is critical in what you just described with respect to the um, 
the professional houses. I mean, this is information put out by the government, the Central Housing and Planning Authority. In 2020, 2021, they sold one of those one level houses for about 14 million dollars and one of the two level houses for about 20 million dollars just recently about a week or two ago the central housing and planning authority advertised that a one level house will now be 25 million dollars that is a 79 million 80 percent increase in the price of the house and one and the two level will go from 20 to 24 which is about a 70 percent increase in the price of the house the troubling factor in all of this as far as i'm concerned has to do with the um, policies that the government of guyana says um, are designed to keep the cost of housing and construction low. They removed the 2% withholding tax that contractors need to pay. It is, they're the ones who introduced that tax. In. They're the ones who introduced that tax, that 2% on contractors. Okay, they removed it, even though they tried to blame APNU for it. Um, they made adjustments to freight costs claiming that that will keep the cost of various things, items coming into the country, low. They provided a zero rating on certain construction materials. They provide a reduction on the duty of cement. And yet, the cost, they, the cost has gone where it is. So it's telling you, it's telling Guyanese that with all these measures that the government claims it has put in place, it is unable to control the cost of living. It is able to control inflation in this country. And that is what people are living with. If you were to look at some, you know, selected food items, you see the same thing. I mean, today, uh, coconut water, for example. If you can get it. If you can get it, has jumped about 50 something percent from where it was um, a last month ago. Well, yeah, I'm not a month or so ago, you know, it has jumped close to 70% from a year ago and, and, and so forth. So, uh, you know, the other problem is you have here is with all this construction that is taking place, you are seeing deadlines being missed. So you ask yourself the question, when you look at this housing and construction, you know, set of housing and construction activities in the country, you ask yourself the question, well, what are these policies doing? How are you managing this economy? Or where are the policies? We're running down on time here, Mr. Lucas, but the second question that came to mind when you spoke a moment ago has to do with the electricity crisis in Guyana. The GPL is um, the engine, if it works, that drives production in our country and it has virtually collapsed now i understand that there's a power ship out there with the capacity for generating 36 megawatts of power i don't know if it's installed i know that we have some um, second or third hand generators which have failed those that have started some have failed some have never started there is incompetence in the management of the energy sector in this country how does that inform what will happen in an expanded grid were the PPP to be in government when such an expansion occurred? Well, you know, uh, Marvin, I will tell you that the current electricity situation, as far as I'm concerned, is clear proof of the false claims of the PPP. You know, I heard the president attempting to blame the AP and UN EFC administration. Which of them, sir? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, I guess the one that was the subject of the eclipse. <laughs> um, you know, he has, he's been attempting 
last week, I think on Friday, or in attempting to blame the current plight of GPL on the KPMU um, coalition administration. But, you know, you, that can be debunked by looking at the budget speeches of 23 and 24. You know, in speaking about electricity in 22, the budget speech of 23 says, electricity expanded in 2022 by 9.3%. The expansion in the electricity supply was driven by higher total consumption. There was no alarm about sounded in the 2021, 2022, or 2023 budget speeches, and nothing was done to position GPL to be different. There was no request for money to avert or fix a crisis. None of that was identified in the budget speeches, you know, um, before we started seeing what we saw here. So if the government waited until 2024 to figure out that there was a problem at GPL, it only has itself to blame, not the APN, AFC. But more than that, if the allegation leveled by the president was correct, then GPL would have been in breach of the law. It would have been violating the law because GPL is required by law to produce a development, a five-year development, an expansion plan, and to update those plans annually. When I left as chairman of GPL, we had a 2020 to 2024 plan prepared. It was available. Now, those plans, as far as I recall, um, you know, had the electricity um, situation, it had in, in mind adding an additional 56 megawatts of conventional generating power on the Demerara Barbies interconnected grid, you know, by 2021. And by this year, up to an additional 120 megawatts more of conventional generating capacity would have been added to the system. So in other words, what I'm saying is that if the government had done what our plan said should be done, and instead of trying to rely on 185 or so megawatts of power, we would have actually had 350 to nearly 400 megawatts of power available today. Since last year. Well, at least we are in 2024, yeah. so it would have been available today. So the information that I provided here really <laughs> reveals the conundrum of the government and the real reason um, electricity supply lags demand. The, th the problem is the government felt that the 350 megawatts that would have been in place in 2024 because of the plan put, it put forward by the APNU AFC coalition contradicted the 300 megawatts of gas, the energy project that the government favored. That's the problem. Say that slowly again with <laughs> some more explanation for our, our um, viewers, please, Mr. Lucas. I'm not sure that everybody would have gotten you. Well, the point I'm making here is that investing in GPL as APNU, AFC coalition, intended to do contradicts the darling project of the PPP, which is the gas to energy project, which would have generated 300 megawatts um, of, um, you know, conventional um, power. That's the problem. So they were caught in a conundrum, which means that they did not take all the risk factors into account when they looked at the, when they were developing this, this plan, this, this gas to energy project. And as a result, has ended up putting this country in a mess. But that is not the only full, that's not the full story. <clears throat> that is not the full story. The matter has been compounded by the collapse of about 30 megawatts of generating capacity at the Kingston Power Plant. And I'll tell you this, people who seem to know something about this problem are saying it is the quality 
of fuel and lubricants that have been used to manage that um, facility, which means, therefore, that a number of the, um, the parts of the system collapsed. And I think um, somebody said to me that they involved some of the crankshafts. So you can't fix that. You can't get that fixed. That is why you see they rush to bring some ship with, um, you know, with the idea of connecting it uh, to, to the grid. And you talk about 36 megawatts. Why do you think you're talking about 35 or 36? To balance out. It's to balance out the 30 megawatts that um, we have a problem with right now. So all of this points to the incompetence, the inability of these fellows to really manage the economy for Guyanese instead of for themselves. That is what, that is what you're really seeing here. And that is part of the problem that we have. Final words from Mr. Ra Lucas, economist, accountant, former chair of Ghana Power and Light and of the Ghana Revenue Authority. Thank you very much, Mr. Lucas, for joining me here on Nation Watch. I know that beyond any reasonable doubt, we have established for the benefit of our viewing public that the economy of this country is in bad hands, that governments led by the PNC or governments involving the PNC have done a better job over the years. So as we come closer to elections, whenever they come, regional and general elections, we will be bringing you more information of this nature so that you can make your decisions from an informed position. Thank you very much for joining us on Nation Watch from wherever you're joining us. Thank you for staying with us the course of the program. Until we meet again, God bless.